Well, we're in the second session then of our study of the book of Jacob. Jacob's letter to the 12 tribes. As you probably know, Jacob is Jacobus in Greek, it's Jacques in French, Iago in uh, Italian, Diego in Spanish, Yaakov in Hebrew, and James in English. So you know it as the book of James. There are some that maintain that that was twist anglicized that way on behalf of the translator of the Bible, King James uh, of England. Who knows? Those are stories. Maybe, maybe not. But in any case, the book that we know as James is actually the book of Yaakov or Jacob. He was very, very Jewish. I mean, he obviously was Jewish, but at the same time, his style and background, he, he, he ties very heavily into his Jewish uh, depths here. And uh, we do, although there are at least four Jameses in the New Testament, we believe he's the, for lots of very good uh, defendable reasons, that he was James, the brother of the Lord, the actual descendant of uh, uh, Joseph and Mary, obviously after Christ was born. And uh, we went through all the scriptures supporting that last time. I won't rebuild all of that. He, his brothers, apparently, the scripture tells us twice that they were unbelievers until after the resurrection. And uh, James and Jude in the New Testament, we believe, were written by uh, descendants of uh, Joseph and Mary, actual half-brother of Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph wasn't his father. Boy, I got myself in deep yogurt in that one, didn't I? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll get letters. Yes, okay. But anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, James not only uh, became a believer after the resurrection, but he quickly emerges in leadership of the uh, church at Jerusalem. Paul, in his letters, when he alludes to people that came to him from the church of Jerusalem, he says they came from James. It becomes almost synonymous with that. We know it was, uh, his letter was not written uh, after 62 AD because that's when he was martyred. But uh, some people believe he might even have been written very, very early. There's evidences several ways, and it's not critical to our purpose here. And, uh, of course, it's written, as it says, to the 12 tribes. It's a, and yet it's for all of us, but it, ha- it has a very, very Jewish linkage and flavor and so forth. And it really deals, it's not in conflict with Paul. Many people superficially reading the letter feel that somehow it's antithetical to the teachings of Paul. Not so. A um, little different perspective. Uh, James emphasizes faith as the starting point for the Christian, but it should reflect itself in deeds, a life of wholehearted obedience to the law to the extent that we have faith in Jesus. And uh, then that all leads to maturity, a goal of perfection and wholeness in the Christian character is one of the emphasis here. And last time we, we uh, got as far as verse 12, we talked about, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, we don't talk much. One of the things we hammered at last time, I just to warm us up again, get us focused. One of the great tragedies in the evangelical community is that we tend to uh, overemphasize salvation by grace, but we fail to really focus on rewards uh, to them that uh, uh, respond in obedience to what God really wants us to do. And there's an enormous body of Scripture that has to do with rewards. Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me. And we, uh, it's it's amazing as you you traffic in the Christian community and you you read and and watch how rarely, occasionally, but not often, people really focus on rewards. Somehow, some people get the impression, well, that's wrong incentives. We do that because we love him. Yes, but he's going to give you a crown for them that love him. So, point is, there are rewards. Uh, One of the things that I think James is going to give us plenty of opportunity to focus on is the fact that there are rewards. There are at least, there are five specific crowns listed in the scripture. Now, the question is, can you lose your crowns? Revelation 3.11, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, hold fast, what the, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You apparently can lose a crown. And by the way, that was sent to, said to the church at Philadelphia. Very provocative. So there are crowns. You can lose them. The crown of life is spoken of several places. The crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, and then an incorruptible crown. We went through all that last time. I encourage you, if those are not familiar to you, to do a little study. I don't believe there's just five. There are five specific ones listed. I think there are many other crowns. Um, there, uh, there are allusions to crowns in general. And what do you do with these crowns when you get them? You lay them on the glassy sea as we see it in, in uh, Revelation chapter 4 and 5 and so forth. We, each of us, have an appointment before the Bema Seat of Christ. And we are going to be, uh, receive the things as appropriate uh, done in our body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad, it says. So, and uh, so many of us will have profit, many of us will have loss. And uh, I think, frankly, there's going to be many surprises before that, the Bema Seat. I think there are going to be many, many prominent Christian personalities that may be surprised by uh, the absence 
a relative absence of, of rewards. I think, conversely, there are going to be people you've never heard of or didn't even know existed that are going to be probably at the head of the list. One of the ones that uh, I love to think about is the thief that died on the cross that was saved. We all know the story. I would imagine, if you ask him what his expectation was, uh, he'd be just glad to be there. You know, I mean, there he was. He was saved seconds probably or minutes, whatever, before he passed away. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He confessed his sin, acknowledged that he needed the Savior, and asked the Savior to save him. And he did. He's got assurance of salvation from the Lord himself. Now, I bet you when he gets up there, he'd say, boy, I, you know, I don't expect anything. I just, I just snuck in before the door slammed, you know. And I bet you the Lord will set him aside and march before him the thousands of people on death row or wherever that came to a saving faith by the testimony of the dying thief. People he's never met, has no knowledge of, but I suspect would accrue to his account. And I suspect we're all in that boat. I think we're all due to be surprised. Some up, some down, whatever. I'm fascinated with the, the song that was sung in the worship in the interval there. Jesus wrote seven report cards in Revelation 2 and 3. What's interesting about those seven report cards, each one had some good news, some bad news. What's interesting about them is every one of those churches were surprised. Some didn't think they were doing so well, they did great. Others thought they were doing pretty good and they were in big trouble. And I think we all can take a lesson. I think we need to work very hard to see ourselves through his eyes. And I think the book of James will help us do that. There are 60 imperatives in just 108 verses in the book of James, the book of Jacob. More than any other book in the New Testament. And I think as we take this study, we should not carry away do's and don'ts from the book of James. I think what he's really after is for us to develop a perspective. If you're in business, you're a businessman or a strategist of any kind, you know that information or details you can always acquire if you know what questions to ask. The precious thing, the deciding thing between victory and failure is perspective, the strategic perspective. If you have that, the other pieces will fall into place. And I think as we go through this book, we want to keep our antenna up on not the details per se, not that they're not critical, but the big lesson to carry away is the perspective. Well, that gets us down to where we start tonight, verse 13, that no man say, uh, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. You hear that all the time, you know, God's tempting me. No, no, God isn't tempting you, not in the way it's used here. When someone asks me, when I'm feeling sorrow or pain or some need, and a friend asks me, what danger or threat is there in your life so that I might pray for you? I would probably answer something like a pray for my illness or that my financial needs might be met or some people would stop doing the things they're doing to me or something of that nature. I would tend to think of having the injuries that are afflicted upon me by some trial. My foremost thought is for the trial to be ended. James is, going, is insisting on a radical change in attitude, radical change in our thinking. Where are the real dangers in your life? And they're not medical, financial, personal relationship in the usual sense, no. The most serious dangers are not what is being done to me, but rather the wrong that may be done by me. That's his point should pray for me that I don't fail in this trial. The temptation here is used in the sense of testing or trial. And it is never correct to attribute temptation to the infinitely holy one. The one who has called us to the holiness of life. God would rather seek to induce us to flee from temptation and take the path of holy subjection to his will. Temptation in the usual sense. Now, one of the things I want you to notice as James goes through here, the way he deals with this is to assert the facts of God's nature and God's will, and then let these facts speak of the dynamics of the temptation. Jesus taught us to pray. Lead us not into temptation. 
That is, don't leave us to our own dangerous ways that would expose us to the pressures of the enemy of our souls. That's really what he's saying. Makes sense. But going on to verse 14. He continue, James continues, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, we're tempted not by God, but by the strength of our own lustful desires. We are deceiving ourselves by our craving for self-satisfaction, self-gratification. And by the way, uh, this drawn away term is a hunting term. It's the term that would use as, as if being dragged away by a predator, if you will. And there is a real danger in temptation. The real effect of temptation is sin leading to death. And we need to reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. We've got to turn it around. In Romans 6, verse 11 through 13, you can put your notes to follow through on that if you like. Now lust dwells upon and brings forth uh, sin. Lust dwelt upon brings forth sin. Having a thought isn't the problem. The th- what do you do with the thought? To have some natural biological reaction instantaneously is nature at work. But nature is something to rise above. It's lust dwelt upon that brings forth sin. And remember, as a, uh, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's the staggering thing about the Sermon on the Mount. You'll discover, we'll notice as we go through here, James, as he talks on these subjects, is never very far from the Sermon on the Mount. He's very Jewish, very connected to the Old Testament, but also very close, as you will see, to the Sermon on the Mount. And the interesting thing is, most you hear so many people talk, say, well, I, I abide by the Ten Commandments. Boy, I wish they did, but uh, that's their view, okay? I live by the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, you poor guy. Ten Commandments are tough enough. Sermon on the Mount makes them worse. Because Jesus um, inter- reinterprets. Thou, you know, Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not murder. But I say, He that thinks in his heart, anger. And doesn't say without cause, by the way. That's the softening of the translators. In other words, the Ten Commandments, with the exception of coveting, which is sort of a gray area, Ten Commandments are overt, measurable, witnessable actions. But Jesus reinterprets those to talk about intents of the heart. You know, the scripture says that only God knows the intents of the heart. Verse 15. James continues, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. We read that. We give intellectual assent to it. And yet we don't fear sin enough. We strive for spiritual maturity. Well, how mature are you? Well, how much do you hate sin? When you hate sin as much as God hates sin, you're getting closer. Sin indulged upon, not just sin stumbling, sin indulged upon leads to death. Ezekiel 18.4 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now the principle that's being established here is that that the minding of the flesh, in Romans uh, 8.6 it says, to be carnally minded, to be minding of the flesh, uh, is death. And the main thrust we're encountering here, very uncomfortable though it may be, it is never safe to trifle with sin. It's interesting, David was frequently under attack or in danger. He not only prayed for the protection from his enemies or his attackers, understandably, but he prayed for protection from sin. When we read the Psalms, I want you to be sensitive to the two sides of the coin. Yes, he prayed for protection against those that were pursuing him. But he also prayed for his own conduct that it wouldn't lead to sin. Boy, can we learn from that. Uh, Let's take a look at a few of those. Let's take a look at uh, Psalm 25. It's a good place to start. Psalm 25. Uh, Well, pick up verses 4 and 5. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. And you get down to uh, verse 20. Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. The idioms he's dealing with here are his conduct. 
not just putting up a wall of fire between me and those bad guys. You follow me? He's concerned that he doesn't act inappropriately. We'll see some others before we go. See, what we should be praying isn't just, Lord, keep me safe, but rather, Lord, keep me pure. We don't think those ways. We tend to think of the externals. We, think of the, we tend to think of, again, our comfort, our need for fill in the blank, whatever, rather than to pray that the Lord help me respond to all of that the way he would have us respond. And so, um, James continues, verse 16, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now, you can make errors several ways. You don't want to be deceived about temptation, but you also don't want to be deceived by his good gifts either. Verse 17, Because James continues now talking about the other side of the coin. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I want you to notice in verse 17 the very first word. Every, not most, not some. Every, every good thing. Whatever's in your life, whatever crosses your path, whatever suddenly arrives on your horizon. That's good. You know where it comes from because this doesn't have any exceptions. Where does it come from? It comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. He is constant. This alludes to the immutability of God, his his unchangeableness. And that's something we don't talk a lot about, but we should. Many people presume from the propaganda that the God of Islam, the Allah of Islam, is just their word for the God of the Old Testament. Not true. The word Allah is not translated. When when Quran is translated in other languages, Allah is not translated. Allah is not the Arabic word for God. It's the Arabic word for the God. It's a specific God. It's the moon God. That's its origin. That's still its symbol on all uh, all the mosques in the world. But the real point is, Allah is presented by the Quran as um, capricious, He's the unknowable one. You can never tell what he's going to do. That's their concept. The God of the Old Testament is the opposite of that. He makes and keeps his promises. He regards that faithfulness as one of his principal characteristics. It's emphasized uh, continually throughout the, his word. So he has no variableness nor shadow of turning. But this father of lights, you know, as a, as a physicist, you can imagine, I'm not going to let this one go. Um, I will spare you the equations, but for each of the attributes of God, there is a parallel kind of equation that has to do with light. When light goes through certain media, it slows down, but when it leaves that media, it speeds up again to the speed of light. You follow me? The speed of light in different media is a constant. Well, the point is, that implies an infinite source of energy in a sense. There is a concept of light when it's collimated. That's when the beams are exactly parallel. And you can do that with lenses, synthetically, obviously. But when you do that, you're placing the virtual origin of that light at infinity. You follow me? And that's what it says here. You see, this word for variableness is paralage, which is the Greek word from which we get the word parallax. Our father of lights in whom there is no parallax. He is infinite, is what that would say to a physicist. And uh, perfectly collimated light has its apparent source in infinity. Now that leads, that gives me an excuse to share with you uh, an analogy. A dear friend of mine, Dr. Alex Metherell, who uh, came to the Lord during my first revelation study back uh, 100 years ago uh, in Newport Beach, uh, and since has been very prominent in the Christian community for a lot of reasons. But he shared, he's also is one of the world-class um, scientists in the area of imaging and optics and such. He pointed out to me, I knew a lot about holograms, but I never saw the biblical analogy, and he's the one who pointed that out to me. Uh, a hologram is a form of lensless photography. It's a way of getting an image with no lenses. In fact, uh, the way you do this is if you have an object and uh, you illuminate the object with a laser, but you set it up so that same laser light can reflect from the object on some film, and your laser can directly 
hit that film. And what the film records is where the, 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 that light intersects, what they call interference, or what we might consider as intersections of the beams. And uh, when you do this, you go through this procedure, you expose the film, and you develop it, you hold it up to natural light, and it looks like a darkroom mistake. It's a cloudy piece of film. It looks like something you overexpose somehow. There's nothing there. It has no desirability in natural light. I was at, uh, in 1963, when Emmett Leith invented the laser. He did it at the University of Michigan. I remember meeting him in his laboratory one time, so this is all very vivid to me. What you do with this piece of film, you set it up again after it's processed, and you illuminate it with the laser that created it in the first place, and the, the uh, piece of film becomes like a window into a three-dimensional space. You look at this piece of film, and you're looking into the space, and you see a three-dimensional image of whatever it was that was there. And what do I mean by a three-dimensional image? Well, let's imagine that I had an unusual pendant or something, or like this microphone here on my shirt. And let's assume I held my Bible up in front of the camera, and you took a picture. A picture gives you a two-dimensional image, a spatial image. And when you develop that and look at it, you would see me with this Bible in the way. You would not be able to see the pendant or the microphone, right? But if it was a laser, if it was a hologram... You could move your eye around to this side and look behind this and see the pendant. I use that to explain what I mean by a three-dimensional image. The uh, the hologram is actually what they call a Fourier transform of the image. It's it's it's, it's, it's in the frequency domain rather than space-time domain, and that's all a way of conversion. But the point is, what's interesting about the hologram is in natural light, it has no form nor comeliness that you desire it. But you illuminate it with the laser that created it, and you see an image. Okay? There's something else interesting about the hologram. Since that's true, as you move around, you can look through a three-dimensional world. If you cut out a segment of the film, you don't lose the image because you can look around the hole to see whatever was there. You follow me? It doesn't stay quite as sharp. You lose a little what they call resolution. But now, you say, what's this got to do with anything, Chuck? Well, the Bible is like a hologram. If you look at the Bible in natural light, it's a collection of old stories and legends and whatever. There's, it doesn't have any integrity to the natural man. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, because they are spiritually discerned. But you take the Bible, and you illuminate it by the light that created it in the first place, the Holy Spirit. And what do you get? You get an image. An image of what? Jesus Christ. Exactly right. In natural light, there's no beauty. In Isaiah 53, uh, verse 2 says that. In, 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 he has no beauty that we should desire him. In nat- the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And uh, it's interesting, too, the Bible. Have you ever noticed how it's organized? It's organized along communication engineering lines. If you are a communication engineer trying to design a communication system, and you're trying to resist either noise or, even worse, you're trying to avoid the impact of hostile jamming, you do certain things. One of the things you do, the channel width that you've got available, you take your message and you spread it across the available bandwidth. That makes it harder to jam. That's what it's called spread, uh, spread spectrum techniques and so forth. Well, it's interesting. The Bible does that exactly th- same thing. Where is the chapter on baptism? Where is the chapter on salvation? You'll notice any of these key ideas are not in one place. They're distributed like a gas law or like a hologram through the whole thing. Tear out a page of the Bible, and you have not lost visibility of Jesus Christ. Every key doctrine, every key truth is spread. You may lose some resolution, some detail, but you don't lose the image of God's plan of redemption, the incarnate word, the one that paid for our sin. And that's not accidental in Isaiah 28. He declares twice, I declare my word precept on precept, precept upon precept, line upon line. Line upon line, here a little, there a little, and goes on. God has deliberately designed it this way. And I'm beginning to believe that these Bible codes, and I don't mean just the equidistant letter sequences, which are so controversial, I'm talking about the macro codes as well as the micro codes and the rest, are authentications that we have in front of us, a message system that indeed came from outside our space time, and you can prove it. But let's stay on this thing here. By the way, on a hologram, if you illuminate that hologram with a laser of a different frequency, you get a distorted image. When you illuminate 
this by some spirit other than the spirit of God, you will get fraud and deceit, a distorted image. Isn't that interesting? I think it's, you know, just had to share that with you. Anyway, I did get a little off the subject, but I, that's all, <laughs> that all has to do with verse 17 in the parallax term. We'll move on to verse, I'll tear, tear you away from that analogy to go to verse 18. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You and I, I think, remember from Peter's letters and other things that we are born of the word, right? And uh, the new birth itself in us is an expression of his grace and goodwill. He brought the word to bear upon our consciousness, our consciences and uh, leading us to confess our sins and to trust the Savior he provided. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The faith that saves you, even that's a gift from him. Not of yourselves. Not that no flesh should boast. Huh? Anyway, so we become then firstborn of him. We become his firstfruits. Just as you know, we just finished the Passover season. I started to say Easter season. I don't know why. We can't seem to get ourselves away from using the pagan label to that holiday. And I love these people that love to say, yeah, I happen to like the King James Bible, but I love these people that say, King James is the only correct translation. Really? It's the only one that uses the word Easter in, the, in Acts 12.4. Because the word is Passover. And all the new translations have corrected that egregious error. But in Acts 12.4, in the King James, it has Easter, which is a faux pas. So I'm not knocking the King James. I love it. It's what I use. But I love these people that somehow feel that God spoke in King James English. Um, anyway. Um, I won't ask how many people are NIV positive. That's a whole other issue. Um, but in any case, uh, it's it, we just finished that, that season. And of course, the Feast of first fruits. Jesus was our first fruits, and we are to be his first fruits. And uh, uh, John Walford makes the point that in Matthew 27, we have this mysterious thing where all these other graves were open and people presented themselves. He believes they were also resurrections to, make, to fulfill the prophecy of the sheave, if you will. And uh, that may be correct. But in any case, we'll move on. Verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Now that can, is viewed by many as a measure of maturity. I will not ask for a show of hands of how many of you feel you've got that mastered. I won't do that to you. But verse 19 can be considered as the theme verse for this letter, the whole letter. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Being swift to hear, we should always be open and listening. I traveled for 30 years in the senior executive circles of Wall Street, and you meet all kinds, winners and losers. But all the winning CEOs I know had one. They're very different in many, many ways, but the ones that were the winners always were listeners. They were always listening, always gathering information about their markets or their customers or whatever. They're always receiving, receiving, listening all the time and learning. The guys that had their minds closed, had their minds made up, you know, obsessively focused, might win for a while, sooner or later would stumble. And uh, receivers, by the way, if you have any background in electronics, receivers generally don't work well when the transmitter's on. You know, if you're a ham radio operator, you know that you, I'm setting aside, you know, certain kinds of multiplex, you know, you're either receiving or transmitting, and if your transmitter's on, you're probably not listening. Now, I happen to live with a very good personal example, Nan. She's always a receiver. When we go out and meet people, she's always asking questions, finding out about them. I always want to talk about, hey, you know what we're doing? (laughs) Blab, 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 you know. (laughs) She won't, unless you ask her and press her hard, she won't speak. She she won't find, what what are you? How old are your kids? What's happening now? And and she remembers, and I could even remember names. I could be a pastor or something. (laughs) Anyway, swift to hear, slow to speak, boy, <laughs> if we could learn to engage your minds before we let it the clutch, huh? <laughs> boy, oh boy, oh boy, a pause of reflection would spare us so much damage. Uh, you might turn to Proverbs seventeen twenty-eight. Even a fool, 
When he holdeth his peace is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. (laughs) I used to sometimes quote in the same kind of context, 1630. Uh, 1630 reads, He that shutteth his eyes to devise forward things, moving his lips, he bringeth evil to pass. But I stopped using that when George Bush became president. I uh, watched my lips, you know. Okay, sorry. All right, anyway. Getting back to seriousness in the text. Uh, the reason for this is that we need to be careful to properly represent the one to whom we owe so much by our conduct and probably our most conspicuous part of our conduct is our tongue. We're talking, in fact, James is going to talk a lot about our tongue. And we represent, we're, we're ambassadors. We represent our boss. And uh, we don't do that as we should. And of course, he talks here about uh, also be slow to anger. Three things. Swift to hear. Sl- slow to speak, and slow to anger. Verse 20 picks up on that and says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We tend to get angry. We'll self-righteously angry. Well, wait a minute. God says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It says that in Deuteronomy 32, verse 41. It's quoted in Romans 12, 19, and echoes in other forms all through the Scripture. It's not for us to right the wrong individually. It's the Lord's issue. And the temptation toward revenge will yield more damage than whatever was done to you. You've been hurt. You've been wronged. Unjustifiably wronged. Your response to that can do you more damage than whatever was done to you by that party. Because it can lead you to sin. James is going to spend a good part of his letter, chapters 3 and 4 in fact, pretty much, on the connection between sinful speech and selfish anger. Here again, James is never very far away from the Sermon on the Mount. He's never distant from those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And Matthew, this is all from Matthew 5, of course. Jesus, uh, as I mentioned earlier, applied the, murder against, the uh, commandment against murder, he applied that against hating, cursing, insulting, and specifically just being angry. That's a sin. The contrast to all this is the righteous life. It's interesting that when the Lord appeared to Abraham, or Abraham in those days, in Genesis 17, first verse, God says to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. Be blameless. Doesn't mean be totally free of sin, but it means don't be indulged, don't indulge sin. Say, gee, Chuck, that all sounds pretty good. I hear you all those platitudes. You can't argue with that intellectually. But now wait a minute. What do you do when... You, when things are going wrong, when people are hurting you, when there's injury being thrust at you, great trick. What do you do when something comes across your path and you're really confronted with some of this stuff? What do you do? You know what a good answer is? Not the only answer, but probably the best answer. Have your quiet time. That's a great time not to sound off or react, excuse yourself, and go find a quiet corner and have your quiet time. In your quiet time, you're with your friend. You can do what you like. I mean, you can let him know how you feel. Him, privately. Because he'll deal with that with you. You know, if you give him a chance. He'd love to. He'd love to. He's your best friend, whether you realize it or not. Private, quiet time is a, is a suggestion that I can't resist underscoring here. Verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, in, uh, of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the ingrafted word which is able to save your souls. Well, first of all, this whole verse gives you a window right into James's worldview. Because he's going to contrast some things. He's going to say, uh, lay apart or lay aside the evil prevalent things around you. Uh, which threatens you, that's implied, and rather humbly accept the word that's implanted in you, which you can, which can save you. But he's contrasting, laying aside versus humbly accept, laying aside the evil, prevalent, the, the evil that's prevalent around you, against the word that's planted in you, 
and that which threatens you versus that which can save you. You see that each element is antithetical to the other. Lay aside the evil that's prevalent around you, which threatens you. Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Okay. You see, it behooves us, as, uh, since we're born of God, to judge in ourselves the tendency to uncleanness and abundance of evil, and to receive in ourselves the word of God, through which we find practical deliverance from the unholy tendencies that we find ourselves in conflict with in ourselves. Now, you use the term salvation of souls, and this causes a lot of problems. This is not our redemption from judgment of our sins. Uh, the judgment that we deserve for our sins. But it refers to the purification of our affections, which are expressed in our soul's activities. For the, at this point, it might be a good time to take a look at Matthew 7. Whenever we get too comfortable, we should always keep one foot in Matthew 7, and we'll pick it up about verse 24. Therefore, whosoever uh, heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and the beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Very simple, well-known idiom, and yet do we really apply it? What are we really building on? We're talking about our affections, our root where we are. And uh, Now, incidentally, in view of this verse in James, minimizing the danger of evil is, in light of this verse, recklessly unrealistic. You can't minimize the danger of doing evil. We pray for safety rather than purity because you and I don't see impurity as dangerous. That's really what he's getting at. We don't realize that impurity is where the danger is. We tend to pray for safety rather than pray for purity. The biblical repentance that we should be crying out for is, God, I don't want to be like this anymore. Not what's happening to me, but it's my response to what's happening that's where the danger lies. Verse 22, but, ye do, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, uh, deceiving uh, your own selves. How many have heard that before? How does one, first of all, become a hearer only? Well, there's about at least four major ways. You can become a hearer only. One is by being relativistic. Letting, uh, falling uh, victim to subjectivity, relativism, comparing one with another, and well, that's not as bad as some people, that kind of thing. The minute you start doing that, you're being a hearer only. Another strange way you can be a hearer only is by being superstitious. What do I mean by that? That's to rely on something sort of magical. You know, it's interesting, uh, Israel did that for Samuel 4. They kept losing. These battles. Well, it's going to be okay. We're going to take the Ark of the Covenant and having it up front, right? That'll fix it. (laughs) They got clobbered and the Ark was stolen. See, they were placing their confidence in the Ark, not in the Lord. That's an easy trap to fall in. You and I can do that with the Bible. You and I can do that with the church. You don't trust the Bible as an object or some kind of ceremonial thing. You want to put your confidence in the Lord. The Bible is relevant in the sense that it's the Word of God. Indeed, don't misunderstand me. But there's a tendency in these kinds of things to ascribe mystical value to things or certain conditions rather than to keep your focus on your relationship with Him. A third way you can be a hearer and not a doer is through emotion rather than understanding. Responding to a message because, oh, my heart was stirred. Great, how long will that last? Where should you be anchored? In understanding what God has said. Not in, in the rhetoric or styling of a, of a presentation or something of that nature. And of course, one of the other ways is being theoretical rather than being obedient. 
knowing all the doctrines and all the check verses and, and uh, all of that. And uh, you do that, you're likely to leave divisiveness behind you rather than relationships. Being too theoretical. Rather than being obedient to his word. First Peter uh, one twenty three. We are born again by his word. And if so we are called to walk in obedience. To the faith that's revealed in the scriptures. To do anything else is to be self deceived. And imagining that somehow intellectual assent is all that's required. There are many people writing. In, Christian, in the Christian field. You, you can sort of get the sense. That there's an intellectual assent. But it's not clear. That there's really a, a wholehearted commitment to the person. Anyway, let's flip that coin over. How then, if that's the case, how do we become a doer of the word? How do you do that? Well, probably again by four things. One is by looking intently, searching the scriptures, digging, not just reading devotionally, not just skimming the surface, but digging seriously, intently. And I personally believe it's helpful if you have that attitude is to invest in your word. You haven't got a good study Bible, go pick one out. Which one's best? I don't know. Wear one out and then pick another one. Invest in a concordance. Invest in a set of encyclopedias or dictionaries. Spend a little money and have a resource base at your fingertips when you're by yourself. So when you have questions, you can, boy, you can get in there, not just skim the little familiar verses. Look intently. Second thing, make it by, by continuing. Making it continuing, not uh, making it habitual, not occasional. Third thing, by not forgetting. Learning the scripture. I don't mean just memorizing, but really learn the scripture. How do you learn the scripture? You eat the elephant one bite at a time. Pick a book and master it. Pick a book. Anyone, wherever the Lord leads you. Go get a couple of commentaries on it. Just one, a couple, get a different viewpoint, whatever. And go through it verse by verse and try to really master that book. Not really master in a literal sense, but you know what I'm saying. Just really make it yours. If you really want to understand that book, you know how to really understand that book? Teach it. Get a little group together. Hey, we're going to go through the book of whatever. And uh, go at about a, ch- a good pace. It's about a chapter a week. A chapter is not too slow that you get bogged down in theology. Yet it's... Uh, you know, it's uh, slow enough that you're going, you're not just skimming along superficially. You know, do a little homework, do the introduction, get through one chapter with your little group, whatever it is. You can stay ahead of them by just doing a little homework and go through the five, eight, ten, whatever, whatever it is. And when you've done that, they will be enriched because of your diligence. You will know that book like you never would, you'd never learn any other way. Four ways to become a doer of the word looking intently, by continuing, not forgetting. <laughs> what the fourth one is? By doing. Applying it. I'm reminded when I was in one of the think tanks, we used to brief uh, general grade officers on certain things and stuff. And I remember one guy had a flip chart. And the title of it was How to Be Serious About X. X being whatever, anything. How to Be Serious About X. One, talk a lot about X. Two, have a file on X. Three, develop a plan about X. Four, have a chart about X. And it went on like this. The tenth one, the end of his list was, be serious about X. You know, we can go through all these things. We can make our, get our notebooks and we'd write notes and we can make charts and we can all this stuff. Uh, nothing replaces really being serious about it. Anyway, moving verse to verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. I like that term. Uh, it must be, a, if it's a man looking at his natural face, it's a natural man. I know there might even be a few here, who knows. Um, but anyway, and they do that a lot, of course. Um, don't laugh, girls, I'll pick on you too. Verse 24. For he beholdeth himself, and then goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Very simple idiom that James is talking about here. If just a hearer of a word, not a doer, you're like a man look, beholding his face in a glass, and you behold yourself. It shows you who you really are. But then you go your way, and you quickly forget all about it. Whenever I come across an idiom like this, I'm always reminded of one evening when we had Walter Martin. My partner and I were on his board, and he was at, he was at Christian Research Institute in those days was in Wayne, New Jersey. We started uh, setting it up so Walter Martin would come to the West Coast and 
He always drew a real crowd, so he was, uh, as people got to know him on the West Coast, he was always a very favored speaker. We were at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Newport Beach. This is the social church at the time in that place. Walter was up there doing his thing. And Walter, you had to get to know him. He had a, a very mischievous sense of humor. He was, when he was in one of those moods, there's no stopping him. But he, he came across a verse equivalent to this one. And he said, uh, he said, the law, in all his great Old Testament seriousness, says the law is like a mirror. It shows us who we are. It's like a shaving mirror. But the law doesn't save. Because we're shaved by grace. <laughs> so that was just Walter's way of trying to lighten things up. <laughs> well, the audience enjoyed it. But there was a cadre of the seniors whose faces fell. <laughs> And I thought we were going to have a problem because <laughs> they didn't think that was funny. I, I, uh, that's just one of Walter's irreverencies that uh, he'd indulged in. And I, I, every, every, time, no, every time I come across a mirror type of analogy in the scripture, I always remember that night where the one half the audience, about two thirds of the audience, was cracking up, and there was this conservative one third that I thought they'd been to a funeral or something. So, <laughs> anyway, if we hear the word. And don't do what it says. We're treating the word of God as if it was useless. If we hear the word of God and don't do what it says, we're treating it as if it's useless. And I'm deceiving myself about the very nature and purpose of the word of God. If I'm hearing the word of God and not doing it, I'm deceiving myself about what its purpose is. And we can't claim a salvation from death while we carelessly persist in sin which kills. Verse 25. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This phrase, the law of liberty, is one that's unique to James. It occurs twice in his letter. It's actually not a unique concept to James, but he uses the, he's the only one in the New Testament uses that phrase. But um, we're going to see it again in chapter 2, verse 12. This, the law of God, is a law of liberty. We don't think so. We sort of tend to see it, okay, it's sort of restrictive. We should stay within these bounds because then we'll be all right. If we go outside these bounds, we could get hurt. That's sort of our, uh, our general model. It's a, a law of liberty very clearly. John eight thirty six, you know, it says that uh, he that's uh, in Christ is free indeed. And uh, Matthew 7, verse 21 to 24, and before you can put your notes, uh, Psalm 19, 7 to 11. But if you want to really get a perspective of this, I encourage you to look at Psalm 119. We won't go through it all tonight. It's a lot of verses. The law is our law of liberty for several reasons. First of all, because it keeps us from falling into a pit. That's a form of liberty, preventing you from getting trapped in a pit or from falling into a snare that someone lays for you. And that's in verse 85 and verse 110 of Psalm 119. Also, the law keeps us from falling into bondage, either of an adversary or from some addiction or some sin or what have you. It's also the law of liberty. Have you ever walked in the dark between your house and a barn or its equivalent? In the dark, without a light, you're very cautious and you're likely to stumble. The law illuminates our path. A lamp unto my feet, and so forth. Now, the question you need to ask yourself as you drive home tonight is, do we really set a priority on seeking this blessing? He says that the man that is a doer of the work will be blessed. Do we really make a priority in our lives of seeking the blessing of being a doer of his word? I won't ask for a show of hands. Verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue... But deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Now, the word is a kalina go geo, which is a bridle, or to hold in check or restrain, to keep a tight rein on. That is the tongue. I have to say, ouch. This is probably one of the most critical measures of spiritual maturity control of the tongue. And there's many, many uh, stumbles that I have, but I, that's probably still one of the ones that uh, is the most unruly in my life. We might hear David again. Let's just take the time. For Psalm 141. 
Psalm 141, pick up verse 3 and 4. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. And let me not eat of their dainties. And so it goes. Interesting, his prayer is to have reign over his own conduct. He knew that was where the biggest risks were. In this verse, of course, James also uses the word religion. It occurs only five times in the New Testament. The word religious also occurs two more times for a total of seven. Ivan Panin would be pleased. Paul mentions it three times. The word religion comes from the Latin. It literally means to bind back, thus rebind a man to God. Commonly, it's a, a term that refers to a system of faith and practice. There are three Greek words that are so rendered, but here we have threskos, which is a fearing or worshiping God. Uh, also, it means the same verb means to tremble, trembling, fearful. I'd say take seriously, something of that nature. Uh, so it, it, the term has come to mean, of course, religious faith, forms, and ceremonies. It tends to emphasize, in its normal usage, outward observances. And uh, he, of course, is emphasizing here, uh, in a sense, the opposite. If any man among you seem to be religious, and brighteth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. He goes on, verse 27, Pure religion and undefiled unto God, or before God uh, and the Father, is this, to visit the fathers and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Sounds straightforward enough. True religion, that is, practice of piety, is active obedience in two different directions. The first one is to manifest a real concern for others, especially the needy. And, of course, there's a whole string of uh, verses we could look at that. that, That's pretty self-evident, I think, to anyone that's had any biblical exposure. Any practice of Christianity that does not exhibit this concern in action is deceptive because it misrepresents the truth about God's own heart. And it's worthless because it's of no value to God. Any Christian practice that does not exhibit concern for others in action is two things. It's deceptive because it misrepresents the heart of God and it is worthless because it's of no value to God. This is a matter of serious obedience. The second part, to walk personally in holy separation from all uncleanness and rise above the world's sinful follies. And this is really three parts. It directs our attention to ourselves, inward purity. It deals with being polluted Espilos in the Greek, which is spotless, free from censure, irreproachable, free from vice, sullied, uh, without blemish. Term used in the Hebrew, which was used of the sacrifices, like the, lamb, the Passover lamb and so forth. Um, and the third thing is uh, to keep ourselves polluted from what? The world, the cosmos, the ungodly multitude. The word cosmos is the whole mass of men that are alienated from God. And therefore, they're hostile to the cause of Christ. And... Um, and we should, be awake, we should wake up to that as a church. We're so spoiled in this country for the last two centuries because we've lived in a, in a sense a Christian utopia in terms of being uh, able to enjoy uh, the religious freedom that's been our heritage. But that's over. We live in a world that's hostile to the claims of Christ and it's increasingly getting so. Pay attention. Watch what's going on. Now, just to finish up here, James is not just a moralist. One who keeps a list of guidelines, ethical guidelines, to live a happy and respectable life. James is one who is committed to demonstrate that he owes everything to his king. There's a big difference. Don't confuse the externals that he's dealing in with what his real mission is here. The nature of James's teaching is to encourage the application of God's nature and his will to our walk, to our Christian practice. Because we are his first fruits in his redemptive work through Christ. So I'll give you one last thing to think about as you drive home and we'll tie it off. Is there anyone in your life who doubts your commitment to Christ? Is there anyone in your life that knows you that doubts your commitment to Christ? Part two, why? Why? Those are the questions I think James would have us ask ourselves. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you that you brought us together. We thank you for your word in which we are born 
into the redemption of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you have brought us to the point of hearing. You've brought us to the point of being convicted by our sins. You've brought us to the point of receiving the redemption that's available for the asking as we approach your throne in the name of Jesus. And yet, Father, as we read your word, we realize that this is not a climax, it's a beginning. And that your purpose and your intent and your heart would have us from this new birth experience go forward and grow and be doers, not just hearers only. Oh, Father, we would just pray that through your Holy Spirit and through your word that you would draw us ever more completely, ever more fully into a commitment that will be demonstrated by our actions, by our words, by our responses to whatever you bring in our path. We ask this, Father, that we each might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we would, through this growth, be more responsive to your will in our lives, that we would be more effective witnesses for our King before those that we encounter, that we might, that our lives might demonstrate your heart and your purpose in our lives as we commit ourselves this night into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.